afternoon. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, first things first, the important stuff. Yes, I am pregnant. You can ask. I'm seven months along. It's pretty obvious. Um, uh, babies do Christmas Day. It's a girl. We haven't named her. It's my second child. So that covers the important stuff. Really, that's what you need to know today. Um, my, my husband and I are very excited to have another child. Um, so I am really excited to be here talking with you today. I'm, I'm sure that many of you have, uh, have you been around archives before? Raise your hand if you've ever been into an archive. We got a few in here, yeah, yeah. And you know, I know you have a, a historical research library as part of the Historical Society Museums. That's pretty similar. Well, I've gotten the impression from a few historical societies lately that archival work is a little bit intimidating. I went, what? Because I do it every day. It doesn't seem scary to me. But when I look at it from my researcher's perspective, and they walk in, and I make them register, and they have to follow all sorts of rules that they don't understand, it's a little scary. So I've decided to come give you kind of a behind the scenes why archives do what they do and uh, explain some great ways to go about archival research to get the most out of your day to make sure that it's worthwhile every time you come in through, come through the doors. So I work at George Fox University. I've been there for one year, but I have also worked in the archives at the College of William Mary and at the University of Puget Sound. I fell in love with archival work as a freshman in college, had never been in an archive before that point, didn't know they existed. I always wanted to work in museums my whole life. And then all of a sudden I met archives and went, oh, wow, you mean I can just sit behind the scenes and play with documents all day long? That sounds like fun. Um, so I started that. I have both bachelor's and master's degrees in history and did an apprenticeship in archives. Most archivists go to library science school. I did not, but I still might go back someday. So, so here's our first behind the scenes thing. What archives are and what archives are not. Archives are not some sort of secret society. You do not have to have any special membership to come in. Um, at George Fox, you don't even have to be a student or faculty member at George Fox. I let anyone in. In fact, I'm bringing in three classes of third graders later this month because I think third graders and historical documents, they're very fragile, are a great idea. Uh, now, I have some wonderful volunteers coming in to help me wrangle third graders, too. Uh, but in fact, my uh, daughter's been in archives since she was born, um, you know, coming to visit. Um, they are open to everyone. You don't have to have a special project or affiliation. Come on in, even if you just have a passing interest. Most archivists are happy to just share some of the special things in, your, in their collection. I bring people in. I have um, a cape that Lou Henry Hoover wore for her official White House portrait in the archives. And I love to pull that out and show it to people. I have a German Bible from the 1690s that's got roses pressed in it. Who knows how old those roses are? I love to pull these things out and share them. So always don't feel like you have to be somebody special to come into an archive. We are actively striving to get more people in every day. Um, also, archive, archives are not landfills. We don't accept everything. But then again, there are very, very few projects that go to landfills to do research. We are selective about what we take into our archive. We don't want to just gather every piece of historical information into every archive that you've ever been to. Because then it would be near impossible to find anything that you actually want to look at. Um, so it's not a dumping ground for everything. Though every archivist in the world will tell you that many people think it is, because we walk into our offices, and even though it's locked up and only a few people have the key, somehow mysterious documents always end up on the table, and we have no idea where they came from. Um, we're also not libraries. Archives are not wide open. You do have to come in and register and go through an archivist to work with our materials or, you know, our students or staff members. Now, the other thing that makes us different from a library is the materials held in an archive are not published materials. They're one-of-a-kind objects and documents. Libraries, if you lose a book, you throw it away, you can almost always replace it. In an archive, something gets ruined, it can't be replaced. You can't find another copy of someone's personal letter from the 1870s just because someone spilled a cup of juice on it. Um, 
It's also not grandma's attic. We try and get them nicely organized and set up for research. We, again, this is why we organize, we sort, we are selective about what we bring into the archives because it's not just a jumble of things that we've collected over a lifetime, although some of them start looking like that, and I'm sure mine does in many ways, but it's a very carefully collected and managed area. Um, the reason we spend so much time and effort writing out our collection policies and figuring out exactly what our focus is is so that you don't have to go to ten different museums to find, or archives, to find documents related to one topic. If every archive in the world collected on, uh, well, I collect Quaker documents, so every archive in the world collected Quaker documents, you'd have to come to George Fox, and then you'd have to go to Linfield, and then you'd have to go to another archive. You'd be traveling every other day just to see five documents, instead of going to one repository that holds all of them. So at George Fox University, I collect the history of the Friends Church, or Quaker Church, in the Northwest, so that's in Oregon, Washington, Idaho. All of the churches that are part of the Evangelical Friends Church in this area send their historical materials to me, so I take care of them. I also take care of the history of George Fox University, um, and then we also collect some Newburgh area history. Now, most of that is tied into George Fox or the Quaker Church in some way. We also will collect little objects and, and collections of people related to those areas. So if, they, if a person has any connection to Friends or Quakers, uh, George Fox University or Newburgh or Peace, we also collect anything related to peace um, and peace activism, then I'll collect it. I'm always happy to do that. Let's see. Um, so archives are open to everyone. We want you in there. This is actually Archives Month. There was a big event in Portland last weekend at the Portland City Archives at Portland State University where they brought people in, let us go behind the scenes. My daughter, I think, was the youngest person there at two years old. She was running around having a blast. Um, she thinks archives are about the best thing in the world, even though she doesn't have any clue what's going on there. Um, there are places that are organized. They are not, hopefully, we're working on getting them not to be a cluttered mess. They are places for research, places for people to sit down and learn and study and treasure hunt. Um, they are places with very helpful people who like to dig through and work and um, help you find what you need. But also, archives are online. Um, many, many of my researchers have some mobility issues or reasons they can't actually come to the second floor of a crowded library and squish in at a small table. So I make things available online, and many other archives do too. So this is an example of um, Swarthmore College. It's another Quaker college. This is their digital repository, and I'm going to show you ours at the end of my presentation. But these are places you can go in. You could open a historical document, page through it. You can zoom in, look closely, but you can do it all from the comfort of your own home which, when you're doing a long research project, saves hours and hours and hours and weeks of work in an archive. And when you can be comfortable in your own home somewhere, you can actually have a cup of coffee while you work. Come on. So, what do you expect when you come to an archive? Well, first, you'll have to sign in. We all keep records of who is in an archive, who comes in, what they use, what they look at, what they're interested in. Now, these records are completely confidential. We are legally and ethically bound not to share any patron records. It's the same as a library. If someone went in and asked what library books you checked out, the library cannot tell a word without a court order. Same thing in archives. So if you have a top secret historical project you're working on, which I know you all do, right? Um, I can't tell anyone about it. Now, it may seem kind of ridiculous. Some historians out there, they are sure that they are the only person doing this work. They don't want anyone else knowing about it. And I sit there thinking, well, oh, someone came in two days ago doing the same research. And then three days before that, I had someone else on the same topic. But I don't tell them. <laughs> um, these are, they're confidential. So no matter what you're looking at, you're not going to find your name published somewhere on the website or your address that you've just given the, them. We collect this information for a few different reasons. We collect it to apply for grants, so we can actually prove that there's some value to what we have in our archives. 
Um, we collect it to make decisions about how to care for our collections. If something's getting a lot of use, then we want to make sure that it has the best care possible, that it's not going to fall apart the next time someone comes in to look at it. So we, we use all of this information we collect to decide you know, if there's anything more we want to collect on, the, collect on those topics, and lots of different decisions. We also will read you a list of rules, or have you read a list of rules and sign them. Now, these rules scare a lot of people away. And people go, I want, why do you have so many rules? Why do you have so many policies? At George Fox, it's difficult because for years and years they've had an archive there. But they haven't had a trained archivist and they haven't had very many rules. So people are used to coming in and helping themselves, getting whatever they want, doing whatever they want, and leaving. Well, when I came in, I said, no, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Now, I do like rules. Leviticus was my favorite book of the Bible for a while because I do like rules. However, I wouldn't put them in place for no reason. The rules we have in archives are there. They're designed to, col to protect our collections, to pre protect the archivists, and to protect our researchers. Um, we don't ever want a researcher to be accused of doing something they shouldn't have in an archive. So we put rules in place. We don't want an archivist to get in trouble for releasing documents that were supposed to be private. So there are rules in place. And we don't want anything to accidentally happen to any of our materials. So again, there are rules. One of those rules is that you will actually be supervised while you work with materials. Now, you're not being babysat. I promise we're not sitting there going, this person's about to steal that document or break it or ruin it. The reason we're sitting there watching is one, to make sure that accidents don't happen, an extra set of eyes helps, and usually just to be there in case you have a question. When you start reading through a historical document, names, dates, people, places, they're all going to pop up, and they're going to lead you down lots of different trails, l learning more and more about whatever topic you're interested in. So if we're, an archivist is there to help lead your project, to help, you, help guide you to other collections, you're going to have the most fruitful day of research you can imagine. That's why it's really important to talk to us. We're there to help you. We're there to make sure that you can find everything you need. Um, we're also there because we don't like it when people walk into the stacks and grab things for themselves. And the only reason we don't like that is it's really, really hard to find how to put them back. Um, you know, in a library, you've got a call number. It's really helpful. and You just go put it back on the plate, shelf with that call number. Well, if we put a call number on every document and every collection in an archive, we would be doing nothing but that for, you know, 40 years. It would take forever. And even if we did it on every collection, it takes quite a while. So every time we work with a collection, we organize it, we put it on a shelf, we label it. Then every time someone uses it, I fill out a form telling me exactly where to put it back so that when I take it off a shelf, I know where it goes. I'm not going to get lost. It's not going to end up orphaned and separated from the rest of its collection. So it seems like we're being really strict when we say, hey, I know you know where the yearbooks are, but you need to just sit down let me get it for you. We're not trying to be mean. We're trying to make sure that we can actually get those yearbooks all back together in the right spot. Um, and believe me, it is very difficult when things have been separated from their collections for years and you've got half a letter and you don't know who wrote it who it's from, where it's going, what collection it's from, and you have to try and figure that out. That takes days and days and days and days, and sometimes you never figure it out again. So all of these rules we have in place are there just to make sure that every time you come in, we can find what you need and we can access it for you. <coughs> so, um, so obviously you're not supposed to find anything for yourself in a way. We find it for you, except we do want you to take a look at what are called finding aids. Now, finding aids are what archivists design. It's kind of like a cross between a library catalog um, card and a book jacket because it has a lot more information on it. We have the information about the author or creator of the collection. We have information about the collection. We even write about you know what kind of research we think it would be helpful for. Put all of that in a finding aid, put keywords and names and dates in so that you can actually find things that are relevant to your research. So most archives will have either um, something you can look on on their computers, the internet, or paper copies that you can look through and see if there's a collection that's relevant to you. 
However, here is the secret of archive stork. Archives are chronically behind. We don't have all those collections organized yet. They're always coming in. And there are lots of other projects we're doing at all times. So, if you're doing, you estimate that in every archive, probably 20% of their collection is not cataloged. In my archive, it's more. It's probably around 70% is not cataloged because I'm pretty new to this. <laughs> so always talk to the archivist about what you're doing because you're not going to always find it in your finding aids, but they might know of a collection that just came in and be willing to let you take a look at it. And even if they can't let you take a look at it because of policies at their place, I'll let you take a look at it. I like to do that. But some places can't do that. They will bump it up on their list of priorities so they'll be ready for you soon. Now, so that's why you want to make the archivist your best friend. I've had people bring me cookies. So that's perfectly fine. No. Uh, <laughs> um, so even though we're not expecting you to wander through our stacks and find things in all of these boxes and old bound volumes, we do want to make sure you find what you're looking for. And we're the experts on it, so please talk to us. We're not scary. We're not librarians. Um, I talk rather loudly. People are always telling me, for someone who works in a library, so come talk to us. We're really excited to help you. So how do you do a day of successful research in the archives? Well, like I've already said, use the archivists. Use their help. Ask them for advice. We know history. A lot of us are trained historians. I am a trained historian. I know how to do research. Um, and we know our collections better than anyone else. Then bring a plan for your research. Have some sort of idea of what you really want to focus on. Um, that can also include a plan for note taking. You want to make sure you have a plan for how you're going to document what you looked at that day and have some idea of where to find it again next time you come in and have some idea of um, an organizational scheme so you can find those notes when you're going to write about whatever you're doing or look back upon it, put it into your genealogy notes whatever kind of project you're doing. So you also want to bring in information. Any names, dates, places, ideas, associations, anything like that you can bring in. Uh, let's say you're doing research on a grandfather. If you know his full name and alternate names, any parents' names, friends' names, that can help. If you know his main dates that he was at different places, if you know he went to a certain college, all of those things help you find information. And the more you know, the more that the archivist can help you. For example, if someone comes into my archive and says, I'm looking for information on my grandfather. He lived in Springbrook, Oregon from this day to this day, and, or, well, or pr around these years, and he was a student at George Fox. Well, then I can pull out my Springbrook collections and show him materials. I can pull out George Fox collections. Because he brought me as much information as he could find, I'm able to find more information. Now, of course, if you don't know very much, we'll help you find more. But the more you know, the more avenues you can go down to find the information you're looking for. Technology is your friend. Now, I know that smartphones and all those can be very confusing. I just entered the smartphone generation just recently myself. And I'm, I'm guessing I might be a little younger than some people in this room. <laughs> so, I know it can be intimidating, but there are actually apps for archival work. There are things that help you scan materials, organize your notes, keep pictures of the documents you're looking at right on your phone or tablet or computer. So, look into those. If you're comfortable using those resources, bring them with you. Archives will let you bring technology to the table to work with you. When sometimes we're a little more afraid of letting you bring paper to the table with you, um, just because it could accidentally get mixed in with your stacks, uh, with the stacks of information we're bringing you. However, I like pencil and paper. I know a lot of people like pencil and paper, and feel free to bring that in too to an archive. Um, it's always best to bring like a spiral ring notebook and not loose papers because then the archivist won't look through and make sure you're not stealing some documents. Um, mostly we understand sometimes things get shuffled around on a table and could accidentally slip in there, but we are very keeping a very close eye on things. We don't want anything in the archives to disappear. And always be patient. Bring plenty of time. Archives work 
is not something you walk in, ask a question, find your materials, and are out five minutes later. Usually, you ask your question, the archivist will have you sit down, fill out forms, and they'll go find your collections, which can take a little while. I've got collections on the top floor of our building and in the basement of our building. So if I have to run down to the bottom floor and come back up with some boxes, it might take a few minutes. And then you're going to have to look through all those documents and scan for the information you need. And that takes time and it takes patience. Usually, if it's something you need really quickly, I'll try and help you or I'll have a student or one of my volunteers help. But that's not always possible. Um, I've had people come in to do genealog uh, genealogical research and spend four or five days in a row all day long sitting in the archives studying and researching. Um, when I've done my own historical research, I did the same thing. I would come in for hours and hours at a time and sit at a table with my laptop working on these projects. So while some questions can be answered quickly, others will take you a long time. Don't come when you're in a rush. And if you can let an archivist know ahead of time that you're coming, we can get as much available for you as possible so it'll go faster. But please be patient with us. It takes a long time to work with documents. All right, so here is a way to think like a historian when you're doing research in archives. When you come into an archive to, to learn about a project, let's say you want to learn more about uh, farms in this area. I was driving through on my way here thinking, I wonder what that piece of land used to be used for and the whole way here. Now, if you come in to do that, there are lots of different ways to learn about it. Um, this is one of the situations where when someone says you think backwards, it's not an insult. In historical work, when you think backwards, you think from the information you want back to the source that might have that information, it's a really good way to look at things. So let's say you have always heard that your great-grandfather was short, and that's where you got it from. Um, these are things I hear in my family frequently, besides my grandfather telling me that we are descendants of Egyptian gods, according to his research. Not sure about that one, still checking into it, but, um, you know, you hear things like that. Well, you know, great-grandpa is short, that's where you got it. But you've never seen a picture, you don't know if this is actually true. Well, if you think backwards, okay, what kind of records would record someone's height? How would I know how tall someone is? Does anyone have any ideas? Military records, yeah. Driver's license. Mm -hmm. Driver's license. There we go. So you've got military records, driver's license, government records like that, medical records. You know, something else, um, baptism records might even have some of that, church records. But another place is if you can find letters to and from this person from friends, if they're going, hey, shorty, the whole time, or teasing them, that might be a great place to find that information. If you find a photograph in an old school yearbook, and you know, he's standing with the whole group and he's two heads shorter than everyone else, oh yes, your grandfather was short. Or maybe he was called shorty because he was two heads taller than everyone else and you're going to be able to prove everyone wrong. Um, so when you think backward from the question you have back to what source might be available, it can help you narrow your search down. Some other great ways of doing research are by realizing that while archives are mostly full of documents, documents are not just a piece of paper. It's not just about the information written on the paper. Documents have an object history, or two. So a piece of paper is not just about the information, it's about the paper. So some historians have done projects that involve smelling every document they look at. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that's a long project. One historian tracked the spread of cholera to the United States by smelling documents for traces of vinegar, which was used as a disinfectant. So when he could smell vinegar on letters, he knows, knew that they had been through a disinfecting process because there was an outbreak in that community. Um, there's also, you know, looking at the texture of your paper. If you're looking at a piece of paper, and you realize it's made out of vellum or an old animal skin, well, this is a much older piece of paper, or someone bought a very high quality because it was an important document to them. On the, on the flip side, you might have something from the 1960s on that wonderful ditto paper that falls apart in two seconds every time you touch it. Archivists hate that paper. <laughs> Onion skin and ditto paper, those are our, uh, our arch nemeses. Um, 
you know, you might go, oh, well, you know, there's probably a copy of this document somewhere. There are ways you can learn. One of my favorite things from my own research is I picked up a letter by Jason Lee. He was a local uh, missionary. He was here in the 1830s um, down at French Prairie. Um, Methodist missionary. I was reading his letter, and I'm like, there's water stains all over this document. What happened to it? Well, I later discovered he wrote it while sitting in a canoe that capsized a few times while he's trying to write this letter because the guide he hired didn't actually know where he was going and they got lost. Mm -hmm. um, so they got stuck in some rapids and they had to tra tra uh, travel across a mountain for three days. This was supposed to be just a, you know, an afternoon trip. It took him like four or five days to get where he needed to go because the guide he hired got lost. And so when I'm looking at this document with water stains, you know, they have microfilm copies of the same document, but I wouldn't have noticed that. All of a sudden, it has a richer history because you can tell that something happened. There was an object history, not just a document. Now there's also, um, if you look at the organization of any collection and archive, if there was an organizational scheme when we got a collection, an archivist is supposed to leave that alone because that teaches you about the person who donated it. So if a doctor gave me all of his records, and he had them sorted by year of birth, that might teach me something about what was important to him. Yeah, age was more important to him than a, a last name if he did it alphabetically. Or um, a great example from just a single document, um, this was something I learned in, in college. One of my history professors pulled out our student attendance sheet, and he said, all right, guys, what can we learn from this? And everyone starts going, well, who's in the class? What year we're in? How our grades are going? And he's like, yeah, yeah, what else? And I raised my hand, and I was a smart aleck. I still am. And I said, we'd know who to look for if the building fell down on top of us. And he just rolled his eyes and laughed. And he's like, come on, guys, think harder. And we're all thinking and thinking. He's like, OK, take a look at this again. What if I told you that in Harvard in the 1600s when the school started, these names would not be arranged alphabetically. They would be arranged according to social class. And I found out that pastor's kids go first. I'm a pastor's kid. I was all for that to be returned, but apparently our society likes alphabetical because it's more egalitarian. And so all of a sudden, I, I learned to read between the lines. I learned to look at not just what's written on the page. You take a look at how it's written, why it's written, the order things are put in, and you learn about what's important to the people who wrote it. Um, and yet, you're looking behind every word on that page. You're looking to see, you know, why is this young woman who's writing a letter, well, okay, my other, my graduate research was a bunch of young teenage women in Maine all attending high school together. I read all their letters. And as you can imagine, it's mostly about boys. But they also talked about dresses, and they talked about other things. And sometimes I got awfully bored reading these descriptions of how many pleats were in someone's gown. <laughs> and then some days I went, wait, 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 wait. They're talking about pleats and gowns. What does that teach me about the history of their time and their place and their social standing? Well, one, they're talking about this because it's something they noticed while sitting in church. So obviously they're not paying very much attention to the sermon. They are paying attention to each other's clothing. And I was able to look into why religion was not as important to some of these women. Um, some of them really didn't care very much, which made me kind of sad. But then I also went, well, if they're pleating their dresses, most of these women are around 18. They're really not going to grow in height very much anymore, where pleats were originally so that you could expand a dress with growth. They just had an excess fabric or money for more fabric. It was a fashion statement, but they could actually afford to do it. So that tells us about their social standing. There's a lot that, tell, that you can read between the lines and think about, well, why are they writing about this? Why is it important? And you learn a lot more about it. Someone says they're cooking a chicken. All of a sudden, you know they can afford a chicken. They were chicken in their part of the world. Um, you know a lot about who they were and their society. You can look beyond those original details. You know, oh, they cooked a chicken. Yay. Um, Although actually one of my favorite letters I ever read was an account of cooking a chicken by a teacher. She was talking about how horribly she was failing at it trying to housekeep for someone during the summer because she is a businesswoman and did not want to be cooking. And she was horrible at cooking chicken. She at one point declared that her chicken was dying and it had cerebral meningitis and she was done. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know, when you read between those lines, when you look at the details and ask 
questions about what they tell you about the broader context, you're going to learn so much more from anything you look at. Back up. All right. So, told you about archivists. We're there for you. You know this. Um, we are not scary, quiet librarians who tell you to shh all the time. I'm really excited because they're remodeling my archive space this winter and I will actually have full walls instead of just bookshelves around my space so the people researching in the room next door won't go crazy hearing us all chattering away the whole time. Um, archivists are not there to be scare you or to be stern um, and believe me I've been researching in archives when an archivist came and told me off for something she didn't like that I was doing. That was scary but we tend to not do that. We like people. We want them to come in. Um, so don't think of us this way. Please think of us as people who are the allies in your research. People are going to sit there and look at a document with you and help you learn all the history behind it and see the details. So how do you find archives? Now you know that a lot of historical societies have archives or research libraries. Universities have them. But how do you find the one that has the material you're interested in? Well, um, my secret is the Google search. No. Google does work pretty well, but it doesn't tell you every archive. Not every archive is online. Not every archive has a listing somewhere. But if you think back, places, like I said, universities and historical societies traditionally have archives, but also religious denominations have archives. Um, Secretary of State's office for every state has an archive and we've got corporations Campbell Soup and Coca-Cola have archives lots of places you know I, I did apply to be the Campbell Soup archivist I thought that'd be pretty fun archiving cans of soup but um, lots of places have these I'm sure if I was looking for um, I keep saying my grandfather's but they one of them just passed away recently so he's always on my mind for research um, if I looked into one of my grandfathers, he was raised in a convent in Canada. So I could contact some Canadian um, Catholic archives and find information on him. He then worked for IBM for years and years and years. IBM, I'm sure, has a historical archive. I can contact them, get information on him. Uh, he didn't go to college, so university isn't going to help me any. But maybe he was involved in some civic activities in San Jose where he lived so I can contact their archives. There's lots, if you think about the groups that someone was associated with, a person uh, or an idea was associated with, and look backwards that way, then you're going to be able to find an archive that they were related to. Now, there are some great websites to help with this too. There's a group called Archives West, and it is all of the archives in the Pacific Northwest uh, not all of them, but many of them are part of this consortium of um, university and research libraries. So we have actually started an archives branch from that where we put all of our finding aids in one place and you can go search for one person's name in one location and figure out which archive has that. So that's a great place to look and I'll show you that website briefly in a moment. Um, but one of your other great tools is to talk to an archivist. If you're in, in an archive and you're looking for something else, again, who do you talk to? Come talk, talk to us and ask, this is what I'm looking for. I don't think you have it. Where can I find this? I have done this for people many, many times and found the archive that would be relevant to them. If I don't personally know of one and can't find it with my handy friend Google, then there's this wonderful thing called a listserv. All of us archivists are on email chains with each other all the time. I get, you know, 20 emails a day from these. But what we do is when someone's looking for research on some topic, we'll email everybody in the whole nation, actually, all the archivists, and say, does anyone know where I can get information on this? And archivists, since many of us do work alone and are miss other people, are very quick to respond and tell you 20 ideas of places to find more information. So we have a network. We have a, a system of people that are all willing to help. So if you can't find it, ask the archivist. The archivist will find it for you. We are there to help. We're there to help research. Um, 
So I am going to show you these in a moment. There are many, many ways you can access it online. If leaving your home is not comfortable, sitting in an uncomfortable and familiar chair somewhere is not a good opportunity for you, you can find things online and you can find people who help you find things online too if that's not your forte. Um, we've got a digital repository where I put many things. There is a new thing, the Historic Oregon Newspapers Project has many, many small town newspapers being put online. Uh, Newberg is applying for a grant right now to do that. Um, there's Archives West that I just told you about. OHSU has many, many things with medical history online, early doctors. Those are fascinating. Um, many, many groups are online and are, they want you to contact them that way because we can, we can scan something and send it to you and we're happy to do that. Um, I told you about this. So if you ever want to come to George Fox and look at our archives, study Quakers or local history, anything like that, you could drop in anytime Monday through Friday, 9 to noon, 1 to 3. I'll be there and my students are there. And here's the secret. If you come a little earlier, a little later, I'm not going to kick you out. I'm usually there. Just 9 to noon, 1 to 3, I'm guaranteed to have somebody in that space. Um, and also, other hours are by appointment. I know some people work 9 to 5, just like I do. Um, so if you can't come because you're working, we can try and work something out in the evening or on the weekend. So just contact an archivist. That's um, at George Fox. I'm always happy to have people in there. And I have students who love to help, too. And while I'm gone, all the other librarians have to learn how to help archives researchers, too. So they're excited to help people. Um, OK. I'm going to show you a couple online resources really fast. And then you guys can try and stump me. That's the fun part. <laughs> All right, this is my online digital collection at George Fox University, the Digital Commons. Um, as you see, we have some Herbert Hoover things. If you didn't know, Herbert Hoover actually attended the academy that started George Fox University. He was there its very first year. His uncle was the superintendent, and his aunt was the principal of the grammar school, and they were raising him at that point. His parents had passed away. Um, and then Newberg meant a lot to him, so he came back many, many, many times to go fishing and visit his Sunday school teacher. It was a very important place in his life. So I have some great collections on Herbert Hoover. Um, but I also have a history of the college, all of our yearbooks, all of our student newspapers, which are really helpful for research. Um, I'll show you some of our really early student newspapers. are very easy to look at. Sorry. So it's really neat because you, now you can go online. If you're looking for a name, you can do a keyword search. You can just search for a name, see if it pops up. It makes finding your grandfather a lot faster these days instead of having to read every newspaper. Um, although sometimes I recommend going through and reading those newspapers because they're really fun to read too. Especially the advertisements. They tell you a lot about the town. Um, so these are large files because we scan in very high resolution. But you can access any of these historical materials right online in the comfort of your own home. They actually show up on my phone really nicely, which it just blows me away. I love to show people, see, look, I can just tell you all about history right from my phone. I look like I know everything because I can look it up right away. So here's what they look like. This is a student newspaper from 1891, and it's online. You can look at it any time. Um, they scan very clearly and beautifully. My students work on this. They scan all of these for me. I have one student who spends 10 hours a week just scanning and putting things online. Um, and he doesn't hate me yet, so it <laughs> sounds like we're doing OK. Um, but it's really wonderful. There's these wonderful, wonderful local sections where people like to gossip about each other. 
And the other awesome thing here is that you can make it bigger. So when it's hard to read, I do this all the time because I can't read something, you can zoom in. Let's see. Bye. Let's see. So all of a sudden you can read that small text really easily. It's a lot easier to zoom in on than an old microfilm machine. Um, this is the modern microfilm, so please <laughs> use it. We're happy to help and teach you how to use it too. I act as tech support very often and I'm happy to do that. So this is Archives West that I mentioned. Um, as you can see, there are uh, universities, historical societies, and other groups all over the Northwest that are part of this, even down in Utah and up in Alaska. Now, these repositories all put their information online, so you can look for somebody. So, let's say I am, I just want to find something from McMinnville. Hey, there we go, Linfield. You can look at the Linfield collections on here and see everything they have. Missionaries, histories of McMinnville College, the vineyards. Um, Linfield also has the wine archives. I don't know if you know this, but they've got the history of all the Oregon win wineries, which is a fascinating, fascinating collection. So, and the last thing, yeah. So that's what I have for you today. I love archival research. I think it's worth, you know, all my all my time, all 40 hours a week at least, and more because I come on the weekends and do things too, obviously. So I think it's very important, and I. Uh, Hope that you all will take some time to step into an archive sometime. Does anyone have any questions for me? I have a question. Uh, last time I was up here was many years ago, but the parking was a problem. What do you do about parking? Um, parking is chronically a problem at George Fox University right now. Um, there is visitor parking over by our security office, but if you need closer parking, there is one um, disabled parking spot right by the library, so that makes it easier. Or you can ask our security office to drive you over in a golf cart, and we can make arrangements to make sure anyone can get to the library easily. Because um, we're kind of in the center of campus, and parking right around there is very controlled. <laughs> Yes, the Quaker room is still on the top floor, and the archives are right next door. Um, so we're connected, and I, and I frequently help genealogists in the Quaker room, too. Um, we also have a little bit more down in the basement now, too. Um, we'll be expanding areas to sit while you're researching this summer, but yes, it's still on the second floor. There's an elevator right next to it, which does make it easier. Um, I'd say on a typical day we're only going to get one, I mean typically one, one to three people in, in my archive space. I will also get emails, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram messages asking for help um, and phone calls. So I think for my last calculation, just from July through the end of September, I had 50 research requests. So that's 50 people contacting me for information. Um, and since that point, I've had, you know, 20 more in the last week because it's our homecoming weekend this weekend. So it's very busy at George Fox right now. Um, but people contact me from all over the country. I've, I've had a couple of international um, requests where people came in asking questions. Um, I have a lot of long-term researchers, too. So if someone, once someone's established, they know what they're looking at, Maybe they have a very large collection they're working with. I have people who've come in for years, and they just come in a couple times a week for years straight doing research. And so um, they're not someone who needs a lot of work uh, help with me, but I um, actively work on the collections they're on to make sure that they're getting the best quality out of whatever they're looking at. Yeah. So how, if you're doing research, how do you know what you want to do? 
<laughs> well, one thing I'm doing is um, we have a shelf list inventory, which is kind of a very preliminary tool for cataloging it. So at least that tells us what collections we have and where they are. Um, I've also spent my first year just looking at everything and opening boxes and looking around. So a lot of it's in my head. Um, and then we are doing, I have a student who's doing a new inventory right now, and we're putting it all onto a computer. We do have some old, old catalogs, which we do use. Um, they're not completely up to date, but they can get us an idea of if we ever had something on that topic, and then I can try and find it. So the best way to find what you need to find in anything in the archives is to, if, if you don't see it in the catalog, you ask the archivist, ask the archives employees. My students are very familiar with what's around, and I'm very familiar with what's around. So even though we haven't processed every collection, we probably have it in an inventory somewhere, or we've worked with it, even if it's not finished. Um, now, from now on, every item that comes into the archive has a little preliminary record create, created for it. It's called an accession record. So we keep track of everything that comes in. So even if we haven't gone through it yet, we haven't organized it and put it into special sleeves and folders, we know what it is, we know where it is, <laughs> so that we can find it for people. And then someday, when maybe if history stops being produced, but I don't think that's going to happen, we'll catch up. I uh, frequently tell people that if history stopped for 30 years, I might just catch up with cataloging, but it, it's a long process. Um, but we are actively working on that to make sure that you can find every collection, even if it doesn't have a very detailed record yet. You said you could sit at home and do research, so what you've got cataloged, you've all scanned into the computer? Not everything, but large collections. Um, so like I said, our yearbooks um, and student newspaper are some of our big ones that we've put online. Those took a long time to do. The newspaper took two years. We got a new scanner and the second half of it took three months and the first half of it took, uh, you know, one and three quarters years <laughs> on an old scanner. But, um, yeah, a new scanner really helped. But, uh, so many things like that are online. All of our Hoover, Hoover collections are online because they're frequently accessed and people are interested in them. I've also scanned all of our photos of early Newburg, again, because they're frequently accessed and people are very interested in them. So as we have requests and as people uh, ask about collections, we set up projects and get them scanned. Um, the other thing I do is if someone comes into the archive and does research and then wants copies of a few documents, if I scan anything for anyone, I put it online right away. So it's done. You know, once I've scanned it once, I don't want to have to do it again in two years when I get to that collection. So it's, it's kind of sporadic which ones go up when. We also have all of the minutes of the Northwest Yearly Meeting of Friends. So all of the records of the yearly business meeting of the Quaker Church, all the way from 1893, are online. Um, which is very helpful when people are doing research. I've seen them used for news stories and all of a sudden, wait, I put that online. <laughs> they must have found that. Um, so many, yeah, many, many things are online, and it's just ongoing, more and more being uploaded. But like I said, any time a researcher asks me about a specific collection or tells me it would be helpful to have that, I put it online. The uh, student newspaper I showed you, the Academician, which was our earliest newspaper, um, a historian reached out to me the other day and said he had been reading all of our early Crescents, which was the early college newspaper, and, and said, but it says there was something before that. And I went, oh yeah, there was. He said, can you put that online? And within a week, I had it all online. He was grinning from ear to ear the next time I saw him. I was so happy that I was able to get it there for him. So I do as much as I can to put it on there. Obviously, though, when every collection is a thousand documents, it's not always practical to get it all online. Um, but we do anything that's going to get a high volume of use. Well, you're talking about like if you want to research your grandfather. I've always been wanting to research my husband's great grandfather. Mm. founded Carlton. So if I were wanted to go and find out if you've got anything about Wilson Carl, do I just come and say Wilson Carl and then see if you've got anything? Yeah, um, we, we look online. I would look at a couple different resources. Um, we, at George Fox, we have a student list for the first, the early, the first 75 years of the college. I have a list of all the students. So I check that and figure out when someone's dates are. 
I check our newspaper collections by doing a keyword search. And that's a good jumping off point. Because once we find out, if we find them in their yearbook or in the newspaper, we know what clubs they were in, what they were involved with, what was happening in their life. And then you can go look at the collections for all those groups and find more information. I had one man come in um, whose father had died when he was nine years old. He was in his 80s, never knew his dad, and came in and said, you know, I heard he went to this college. Can you find anything? Came back the next day, and I had the whole table covered with pictures and play programs and um, choir build, uh, programs. And he just started crying. He never knew that his father sang. He didn't know he acted. It was a wonderful moment. So You're talking about people that probably went to George Fox or whatever. Yeah. But if a person who is just in the community, I mean, I understand that Wilson Carl was helpful in establishing Winfield College. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he's just in the community, but has nothing really to do with George Fox. Now, we don't yeah. have that kind of information. Sometimes. Um, and that's something, sometimes I can find it in, um, sometimes I have it cataloged already. Um, sometimes I have some files on individual people, so those are helpful. Um, if he was in, in influential in starting Linfield, then they're, they're yeah, Linfield, definitely yeah, able, yeah, able to help. Yeah. 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 Um, Rachel Woody is the archivist of Linfield, and she is wonderful, really, really helpful. Um, a lot of archives have kind of individuals' files, what we call it. It's for... All those random little bits of paper that we collect about individuals that aren't a full like box size collection, but you know, someone will give us their obituary, some newspaper articles, some photographs, and a couple letters. Yeah. Well, so we throw together these files and just keep them sorted by last name. So a lot of us um, have something like that that we can help you with. Um, uh, my yeah. daughter always wanted to write a biography of him, but so I'm just trying, actually trying to help her out. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd take a look at Linfield, I'd take a look at Archives West, search by his name. Um, also, you know, one thing that works great is going on Google and searching someone's name and the word archives. If they have it, if it's been cataloged, it'll often show up really well. I think I did look him up one time on Google and there is a little bit about him. But, yeah. But you said go on Google, look his name and look for archives? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, archives or collections. Um, that way you're going to get narrow it down to the, the scholarly resources. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd just like to interject a little bit about our Lafayette Museum. I don't know if we're listed on that directory or not because we don't have anything that's been scanned. Right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, uh, you, you, you could spend a week there and not be done. <laughs> yeah. Just on your family. Yeah. And we don't charge for parking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. I'd love to come visit sometime. Archives in the attic, we just had, um, we go up there and we down, so we got to downsize. We all have to move it over. And, uh, Okay, you get a uh, Beaverton yearbook from 1923. We throw it out, or we, uh, is, is there any value in it? There, are, there is value in that. Um, what I always suggest is try and find an archive in that area that collects those types of materials. So I have some like Chehalem High School yearbooks um, and some... Newburgh local ones. And I will always add it to my collection if it's one that I don't have. I always ask George Fox alumni too to let me know if they're throwing your books away because I might, I'm just missing a couple from our collection now. So what I, I always suggest is try and find a place that has that. If you know an archivist, feel free to call them up and ask if they know who collects it. 
because we'll help you figure it out. Um, if you're getting rid of, you know, old family documents, things like that, talk to an archivist too. It might be worth a historical collection. People don't realize that their day-to-day -day lives or diaries, things like that, are very valuable to historical research. We want those things. So when you're downsizing your homes and you come across photographs, diaries, letters, anything like that, um, call up an archivist in the area and see if they're interested or know someone who would be interested in that collection. Um, because, you know, you may not think your life's that impressive. I, I have people tell me that all the time. Oh, you don't want my stories. And I say, yes, yes, I do. I want them more than I want some of these political figures and things. Um, so don't, don't think that your history is not important when you come to that kind of stuff. Please talk to a historian or any sort of specialist in archives or historical work and see if they're interested. Even if they're from Nebraska? Even if they're from Nebraska. We can point you to an archive in Nebraska that will collect something. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've helped a, quite a few people. Um, George Fox University is right next to the Friends View Retirement Homes. Um, beautiful place over there. And uh, their residents call me very frequently and say, I'm trying to downsize. I have these documents. Can you help me? And I've gone over there and looked at things with people and given them an appraisal of, you know, this has historic value. This one doesn't. Uh, or, you know, this we'd be interested in. This you feel free to throw it away. Um, archivists like to throw things away, too, when they're not relevant because <laughs> it's one less thing we have to catalog. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And next month, our program is going to be on the murder quilt of Yamhill County. Um, Jean Sartor and a group of ladies have been recreating the murder quilt, and they're going to tell us all about the trial 100 years ago because next month is the 100th anniversary of the murder quilt. So uh, please come back for that. And uh, you might know. Sorry. I'm going to add, Sarah, yeah. you might know the story of the murder quote if you've been here in Yamhill County for a while, but we have the rest of the story now. Yes. Well, good, good. I, I am looking forward to hearing the whole thing because I've heard about the murder quote, but I don't know anything about it. So, and I think that's it. We're going to take thank you off being here, and uh, we'll see you next month. Take care. Thank you.